Welcome to the ATP Project. This is the Modern Women series where we take a more detailed look into women's health, hormones and everything in between. As always, this is for information purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, prevent or cure any condition. Hi everyone and uh, welcome to 2021 with the ATP crowd and with the Women's Podcast. Um, we are so excited for 2021, aren't we, Nicole? We are. Oh, We're hoping some... for a much better year this year. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it will be. And we have some great podcasts that we've lined up for the rest of the year. Mm. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a mixture of you know, our own podcast, uh, just us talking about interesting topics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have some really exciting guests lined up uh, for the rest of the year as well. Um, we'll be you know, covering many topics such as uh, mental health issues, uh, dietary issues, ketogenic diets, and all of those kinds of things with some experts out there. So really looking forward to it. Mm, it's going to be great fun. Can't wait. Mm. So Yes, and I guess there's one one other thing we probably should address. I know, um, what's up with well, the elephant? We have an elephant in the room <laughs> sitting at the back there, so we probably should address that. I think <laughs> so, so. So, New Year, um, Women's Podcast, I don't know if anyone sort of noticed, but is now a duo, not a trio. So we are missing one person, so Danielle is not with us anymore. Um, she left work one day, never came back. We don't know where she is. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. No. Um, so, Danielle, we're pretty sad to see her go, but she's moved on to do other things, do some further education and, um, yeah, take a different path, which is exciting for her. So, oh, yeah. Yep. So, it's just going to be you and me this year. That's right. So, yeah. you know, we'll definitely miss Dan and, um, you know, wish her all the best for her exciting journey ahead. Yeah. So, you have to put up with my jokes all by yourself now. <sighs> Oh, sorry okay. about that. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll make it work. Yeah, we'll make it work. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't you leave because if then I'll have no one to tell jokes to. <laughs> we'll have to get Lauren we'll in the background. We'll have to get Lauren in. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, yeah. awesome. Uh, Looking forward to things to come. That's right. Yeah. See ya. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to another episode of uh, the Modern Women's Podcast. And I'm here with my colleague, Nicole, um, <laughs> and I'm Yelisma, as you guys all know. And today we have like an interesting little topic, um, which is going to be around gut. But I know that you probably have heard a lot of uh, uh, um, podcasts on gut. But we thought we'd make, uh, make it a little bit more interesting and look at all the different things that could influence the gut. Because we know, you know what gut symptoms are. We know, you know, some people have irritable bowel syndrome and they get, you know, bloating and, um, you know, give even, get even diagnosed with some kind of uh, bacterial overgrowth. But there's so many different things in our environment and our lifestyle that can actually influence our gut health that goes beyond the general things that we all know about. And so that's what we're going to do today is kind of like do a bit of an overview on everything that can, um, I guess, produce gut symptoms or influence our gut health. Mm. So I'm pretty excited to talk about that, Nicole, especially because we had a very interesting trip yesterday, didn't we? We did have a really interesting trip. It was very time, uh, very timely, actually, to, to mm. do that. So we went and visited a lab um, that, do, that specializes in stool analysis. And it was really cool, actually, some of the things that we found out. Yeah, like mm. I learned a lot, you mm, know. And it was really cool to see, like, the different methodologies that uh, uh, different labs use in order to analyze tool tests, um, you know, what they test for. And it's not that one methodology is, is, is better than another, but they're different. So it's, I guess, what your, what your answers, the answers you're looking for in terms of the methodology that you're looking for in terms of the lab. But mm. uh, incredibly sterile and clean as oh, well. Amazing. It had no smell whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> <Did it? laughs> yeah, you'd think, you know, any yeah. kind of uh, stool testing, well, you know, you've yeah. got to be brave, but yeah. um, it was a it was sterile. Immaculate, wasn't it? And yeah. the machines were amazing. Like oh. that million dollar machine? Yeah. That floored me. It just looked like expensive. a big white box. It yep. was a million dollars. <laughs> big expensive machines. <laughs> no? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And we had to wear the well, you fluffy, had to wear the, <laughs> I had to wear the you, fluffy you shoes. Didn't, you didn't um, comply with the regulations and wearing clothes shoes, Elizma. So you had to wear. I you had to be punished and wear the the white booties. 
That's right. <laughs> a bit like, you know, looked, looked a bit like dwarf shoes, but that was all good. It was so much fun, though, and, you know, just learned so much. So that makes today's topic actually very timely, like mm-hmm. you mentioned, and uh, inappropriate. Yeah. So, all right, so if we look at what can influence gut symptoms and gut health, I guess we can start with the most obvious stuff. Uh, which, you know, the listeners would have heard plenty of podcasts on, and that would be gut dysbiosis, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what is gut dysbiosis exactly? Well, dysbiosis basically just means an imbalance between your um, your microbiome, your, your gut bacteria. So your good bacteria, your bad bacteria, it's just a, a, the ratios are out. So um, basically that's what dysbiosis is. I'm glad you said that because... You know, a lot of people think gut dysbiosis is they have to have a pathogenic or harmful bacteria, you know. And when we look at pathogenic bacteria, what comes up to, in, in my head is more things like salmonella, food poisoning, things like that. What we're talking about, when we talk about gut dysbiosis, we're talking about normal commensal organisms that become out of ratio, they overgrow and they are in higher numbers than they need to be for someone to be healthy. So it's not that the organisms are good or bad. Generally, all these organisms live in us in some form or fashion, but yeah, it is when they become overgrown, usually because they have an opportunity to become so, overgrown. Yeah. So what are the things that can create this opportunity for organisms to become dysbiotic? Oh, so many things. Um, I guess we could start with diet. It's mm. a big one, isn't it? Absolutely. What we're putting in our mouth has a huge impact on how our microbiome is, um, how healthy it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you eat, they eat. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. What, so what kind of the saying? It's not. It's not we are. Well, isn't yeah, saying? yeah. It's not what we are. We are what we eat. But it's something weird. Or, no, I think it's. No. That's. I think that's it's the not one. We are who we eat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we are who we eat. No. No, no that's cannibalism. <laughs> we don't do that. No, we don't advocate for that. No. Uh, disclaimer. We are what we eat. <laughs> that's right. We are what yeah. we eat. Yeah. And so, what kind of foods can have a really big influence on, on, on gut bacteria? I guess. What do they like to eat? What? Do, well, they love fiber. Mm-hmm. Mm, so fiber is a huge one uh, and I'm, it's really interesting around fiber and we'll get into that with diets later and how that impacts um, lack of fiber but carbohydrates that sort of thing they love they love all that sort of thing to to help create um, their the more beneficial bacteria um, and things like processed carbohydrates and sugars mm. and um, highly refined foods, they can be really detrimental to our, the health of our microbiome. Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. It's generally that kind of typical, the typical foods that we find in the modern Western diet, all those processed carbohydrates and sugars, they are often responsible for the overgrowth of a lot of um, organisms and then these organisms become pathogenic. Yeah. But of course, you know, there, there's some organisms that love fiber, some organisms that love carbs, some organisms that love protein. Yeah. And depending on your diet, can, that can kind of determine what your gut micro, microbiome is kind of made up of. Mm. So someone who's following a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet or a vegan diet will all have like a different um, makeup of their gut microbiome. Yeah. Definitely, because you'll, you'll lose some diversity in some that aren't being fed and you'll increase the diversity in others that are getting a lot of that fuel. So um, we all have very different microbiomes depending on what we're eating. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I, I actually was listening to something the other day and there is a correlation um, with, uh, um, oh, I won't say like ethnic communities, but how you've grown up. So mm. different nationalities. Traditional have, diets. Yeah, traditional diets. So say Middle Eastern diets. Um, they they all seem to have have very similar microbiomes, and if they introduce different foods, it can affect them negative, negatively. Whereas if we, you know, say in, in uh, Western countries, if we try and eat say some of the foods in more of those Middle Eastern countries, we can end up having um, issues with that. So it's really interesting if you look at your, um, you know, your family your ancestry, yeah, mm. and what they're eating, and that's basically what works best for you. So I thought that was really interesting, and you know, we're trying to do these specific diets and, and different cultures are trying to do diets that are in the mainstream and it doesn't work for them and that could be the reason why because the microbiome is just not set up for that. Yeah, that's a very, very good point because we already know from um, statistics that when um, different nationalities, for instance, the Aboriginal um, people, uh, a lot of the Islander people and even in Africa, when they were introduced to the Western junk food diet, mm. Um, they develop diabetes and yep. all of these chronic health conditions, Obesity. whereas we kind of like get away with a lot of that because our genes have had time to, uh, to adapt, I guess, to these 
uh, food choices maybe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we do see that some diets do not affect certain um, ancestries uh, mm. very beneficial. Yeah, it's really interesting actually. So yeah, definitely. Right, what else? What else can kind of affect the gut microbiome? Um, medications is a big one, a huge one yeah. that we see all the time because it's, there's so much, um, you know, over medication now. So um, things like your um, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors or acid blocking medications is probably one of the biggest ones. It's one of the most widely um, prescribed medications. Um, we see so many clients that are on those acid blocking medications and it can have a huge detrimental effect to the microbiome because it's reducing the acid in your gut. We don't have enough acid in our gut. We can't break down our food effectively. It can sit there, it can ferment, it can um, start to you know, um, become rancid and then we can start to develop this um, uh, extreme um, dysbiosis. So that's a really common, even things like SIBO is really common in um, people that are taking PPIs. Uh, and it, it, yeah, as I said, it's very prevalent. So we're seeing it all the time. Yeah, I mean, I've seen personal clients who've been on PPIs for 20 years. Oh, yes. Even though the leaflet inside <laughs> says, do not use right? for longer than six weeks. Yes, right? Yes. I, I mean, I've seen a client that literally his nails were falling off, his hair had oh, all fallen wow. out because 25 years he'd been on this medication. He had no, he wasn't absorbing any nutrients. So, so nutrient deficient. Um, but yes, it's, yeah, six weeks max. And, you know, these people are on them for the long term and they're not being told to to be to only be on them for a certain amount of time as well, which is so it's not their fault. They're mm. just doing, you know, what they're being instructed to do. So uh, that's a huge problem. Absolutely, because, you know, we know that some organisms are acid uh, sensitive and some organisms are alkaline sensitive. Mm. So our bodies actually have a unique mechanism in keeping it um, balanced through that stomach acid production, like, you know, you made a very good point, you need it for the food uh, digestion. Mm -hmm. If you don't digest food, there's food particles that can then be fermented and eaten by these microbes. Mm -hmm. um, and then they use the nutrients and, and you miss out on it. But you also need that stomach acid to kill off acid sensitive organisms. And then, you know, you also need that acidic food bolus so that once it moves into the small intestine, which is the next step of digestion, mm -hmm to trigger a bile release, which then kills off all the alkaline sensitive organisms. Yeah. Now, if, if that food bolus is not acidic enough because you're using proton pump inhibitors, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get that bile release. Okay. And then that allows those organisms to grow in the small intestine and then um, you know, result in issues such as SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting the amount of clients who see that, um, that are not told that generally when they're getting severe reflux and, and heartburn and that sort of thing. And I can understand they want to they want to alleviate those symptoms because it's painful, but they're unaware of the fact that 95 plus percent of the time it's not high stomach acid that's causing that, it's low stomach acid. So then they're giving an acid blocking medication, which is exacerbating the symptoms. Kind of, kind of productive a little bit. Yeah. 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 So that's a huge one. Um, another big one is NSAIDs. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so you, you yeah. know, you know, your painkillers, mm. that's huge for um, degrading that, that gut lining, that mucous membrane and causing a lot of damage as well to that gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so insects we know can cause a lot of gut issues because mm. even, you know, uh, a lot of doctors would even or medical practitioners will warn not to use insects for prolonged periods of time because it can cause a gastric bleeding, unexplained anemias and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of pain, of course, as well, because it can cause that um, ulceration of the um, of the stomach lining. So mm -hmm. definitely uh, another one that can affect, you know, the gut microbiome and also the gut health as well. Because we know that it's not just all about things that that kill bacteria. Yeah. You know, like we learned from the lab yesterday, there's this mucus lining that sits on the on the on, on the epith gut epithelial cells. Yeah. And that's where uh, a lot of our our uh, good bacteria is kind of like situated. So anything that breaks down that mucus layer mm -hmm you know, will affect our gut microbiome. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, NSAIDs is certainly one of one of those uh, medications that can do that. And it's it's a worry because there's so many, they're available in the supermarket. So people yeah. aren't going to think that they can actually be detrimental to your gut So because they're so readily available and, you know, there's not really any significant warnings on there if there is a tiny print. So um, you don't really think about that if it's really readily available. So yeah. Well, no know. one reads the fine print in the box anyway. No, you know? and we're just taught get a headache, take a Panadol or you've got, you know, any sort of pain, just pop a painkiller. Yep. So, yeah, it's a bit of a worry. But one of the most common drugs that I think everyone would know, would know by now that can really affect the gut microbiome mm -hmm. is antibiotics. Yeah. 
Yeah. And how often are they prescribed? <laughs> a lot. Yes. You know, um, yeah. sometimes for good reason, you know. Yes. Uh, so we're not uh, bagging antibiotics. There no. are definitely certain situations where that needs to be the treatment of choice. Um, but we also know from history um, is that there are times when it becomes, there were at least times in history when it was com very much overprescribed. Mm -hmm. That's been honed in a little bit, um, you know, due to uh, buck, uh, gut bacteria resistance and things like that. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, a big one that can, um, you know, affect the gut microbiome. Yeah. And it's, it's sad because, you know, we're in a society again where it's just a, a quick fix. So it's not looking at the root, the root cause. And so people are very, um, very quick to go, well, I've got this infection. I need to get some antibiotics straight away. And the worrying thing is now, and I, I heard something the other day about this, that a lot of doctors feel under pressure to prescribe because you're getting these clients coming, these patients coming to them saying, I want this. And if they don't get it, they're going to go somewhere else. And they're now prescribing them for viral things as well. And we know antibiotics don't work for viral infections. So, you know, what, what damage is that doing? They're not, not fix, you know, not, um, fixing the problem and then they're also creating another problem on top of that. So it's, it's quite worrying. Absolutely, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know, um, we always think of prescribed antibiotics, but we also mm. know that it's, it's, it's in our food uh, supply as well. Yeah, and how scary is that? Because you're right, you know, even organic farmers have to by law use a certain amount of antibiotics due to food health and safety and, uh, and all of that. Um, but yeah, so you know, no one can really get away from it completely in the food chain. Um, it is it is unfortunately there, and we don't know that low grade antibiotic intake. You know how that can um, make make certain more pathogenic organisms mm. more resistant to medications as well. And what and when we look at women who are pregnant and they're having to eat obviously the foods, the foods have um, you know small amounts of antibiotics in there. What's that doing to the to the baby when the baby is born? It's microbiome. What's that going to be? How's that going to be affecting that? And is that why we're seeing more incidents of things like your, um, you know, uh, atopy and um, lots of allergies and things like that? Is that because of what the mother's eating because it's in the food? Um, we can't get away from it. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Mm, yeah. So it's scary. And even when we're trying to do the right thing with our diets, we still can, you know, fall down in those areas because of what's actually been put into the food. Yep. So, yeah, it's a little bit scary. But one of the things that I find is very underrated and often ignored as, a, my, in my opinion, a major cause of gut dysbiosis and, and, and chronic illnesses that stem from that is dental health, oral health. Yes. yes. We don't talk enough about that, do no, we? No, we don't, we, we don't think of the correlation between the, the oral and the gut, which is quite funny because it's all connected. Yeah, well, this, this is the first part <laughs> this of your is the gut. First part. That's where the, the digestive process starts in the mouth. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we have to really have a look at that and what's going on with, um, with our oral health. Yeah, because we know that the human mouth is full of bacteria. That's mm. one of the reasons why when you get bitten, you know, they, they, um, they usually very, uh, uh, I guess, considered of infections and things like that. Uh, you know, the mouth is considered a dirty space for all intents and purposes because of all the microbes there. Mm. But we swallow these microbes all the time. Mm. Now, that goes back to the stomach acid. Mm. And the stomach acid is designed to kill off all those bacteria that we're swallowing. So they're not really supposed to survive. Mm. But it is when conditions are adequate for them that they will then start to overgrowth and take over a lot of these bacteria that we swallow. Yeah. And we know we know we have candida in, in, in the mouth. We know we have streptococcal species in the mouth. Mm. And these are common things that we see in um, stool samples with uh, with ill patients. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always the thing, you know, that I, I guess we've just spoken about for a long time as, in, as naturopaths is that the plaque on your teeth is, is the same as a plaque um, you get when you on your um, arteries. So heart attacks. So that can be related to to oral health yeah. as well, um, and that's very well known. So yeah, I mean, we we, they, we already know there's a correlation between um, strep bacteria and a heart condition known as rheumatic fever. Yeah. Um, so it just shows you how a, a lot of these organisms can affect um, other systemic conditions as well. Yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about you, Nicole, but. I actually see a lot of people with uh, who's had root canals in and they end up, not, not straight away of course, because yeah. these things take years sometimes mm -hmm. to kind of eventuate, but they end up with things like SIBO or, or gut issues. And as soon as they get the root canals removed, they, their issues just resolve. You know, I've even had clients who developed autoimmune disease from the bacteria in the root canals because there's tiny little um, canals 
in the teeth. And um, even though you're getting like, that kind of like connects with the bone, the jawbone, and that connects to a lymphatic kind of system that, that drains. Mm -hmm. And it's in those canals, I guess, where a lot of these bacteria can start to, to proliferate and yeah. breed and, and get into the lymphatic system and kind of, you know, cause illness in some people. Mm. Not in everyone, but definitely yeah. something to consider if you have a lot of um, health issues and you have, you know, a lot of root canals and or just problematic teeth or a problematic oral health. Yeah. That would definitely be a big place where I would start looking. And it comes back to what we're talking about today is things that can that can affect gut health that we may not think about. Hmm. And when when we see clients, I always go back and say, well, what, you know, what happened or do you remember anything that happened significantly where you from then on you started to your health went down or and a, a lot of times initially they say no, I can't remember, but then we dig a bit deeper and they say, "Oh, actually yeah, I had a root canal." 10 years ago. Yeah. And that from yeah, now I think about it, I was fine until then. The so timeline. The, yeah, mm. so the things that you wouldn't automatically connect to your current health conditions that could have could have been the, the initial driver. Absolutely. Yeah. So people oral health, if that's something that you struggle with, you know, definitely consider that as a possible root cause mm. for your issues. Floss people. Floss. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about diets, Nick. Mm. Because we touched on it in the beginning in terms of fiber and carbohydrates and sugars and all of these food components that bacteria like to eat. And we all we know that different species of bacteria like to eat different types of food. Um, but I think it's important to talk about that because there are so many different diets out there. I mean, look back to, you know, 40 years ago, it was a low-fat diet or a high-carb diet. It was kind of like very simplistic, it was. right? Um, but these days, so many different types of diets. So what is the risk factor for, I guess, um, uh, eliminating foods or uh, following very restrictive diets? Let's talk a little bit about that. Mm. So with a lot of these diets, we are actually reducing um, diversity in our microbiome. So as we said earlier, a lot of these um, type of bugs need specific foods. And if we're taking them out of our diet, they can die off. And a lot of times once they die off, they won't come back. So we can lose them forever. Mm. Um, and then obviously that can affect the um, diversity, the ratios, and then again um, contribute to that that um, dysbiosis. So, you know, a lot of the popular diets now, the keto diets, even paleo style diets, low FODMAT diets is a huge one as well. We're eliminating a lot of these foods that these particular bugs like. Yeah. Um, and so that is causing a lot of problems. So, um, and look, there are, some there are some great benefits for some of these diets. So the keto diet can be great, but long term we're starting to see a lot of issues with that now, you know, reduction in these particular um, microbes that, that are really important to our health. So um, losing those fibres particularly, so we need those fibres to create short-term fatty acids um, and then we need those that they they feed the colonocytes that help to keep our colon healthy and that sort of thing. So it's really important to not be eliminating these things long term. Mm. And I guess FODMAP's a big one that we see that people put on FODMAP, low FODMAP diets, low FODMAP diets, not no FODMAP diets, which a lot of people seem to be ending up as. Um, and they're on them for years. Mm. And because initially they feel better, of course, because you're taking away the trigger foods. But they're, they're designed to be a short-term thing where you're going in and fixing the underlying problem. So if you're just going on these diets and not doing any work around that, then you're creating more of a problem than you had in initially. So they're things that we really need to be mindful of when we're looking at these diets. So, But fiber is a, is a huge one. So, yeah. yeah. And that's probably something that, you know, most people on a, in, on a modern Western diet need probably more of yeah. uh, is fibers, especially plant fibers yeah. that are rich in polyphenols as well. Yes. Um, and it's a lot of those kinds of foods that we're just not getting in on a regular basis. Mm. And, and I think that's the important thing. It's not about bagging a specific diet, but we can probably, there's, there's species that will suffer on, on any diet yeah that is restrictive in a certain food group. Mm. Now, uh, I'll probably say sugar is the exception here because I can't think of any good bacteria that goes <laughs> on sugar. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, you know, we do need carbs, we do need fats, we do need proteins because mm. they feed a diverse species. And when we talk about microbial diversity, it is the more different types of bacteria you have because, yes. um, you know, w when they do analysis on, um, on a, 
humans who have lived out, out of society and, and, and been eating traditional diets and things like that and not pro non-processed foods, they find much uh, higher microbial diversity, you know, 3,000 plus species. But what they're finding is that in some people who have, um, you know, very poor diets, uh, it's a lot less, like maybe a 1,000 species. Now, of course, that's just the, dependent on the ways that we can measure these things today. I'm not saying that that's an absolute truth because we can only measure for what for the equipment that we have mm -hmm. and what we can see mm -hmm. you know it may end up in 10 years time we have equipment that can measure more and we find out that that may be not necessarily 100% true but in general they, they do find much less species uh, in people who follow um, restrictive or very processed food diets yeah even modern day life so now obviously we used to eat with the seasons mm. we don't eat with the seasons anymore because we have these particular foods av available all year round because we then have them imported when it's their off season in where the country we're in so people are eating less and less variety of foods and so that's another way that they're we're losing diversity as well because we're designed to eat seasonally we're designed to eat a wide variety of um, plants and you know fruits and vegetables and things like that and you know how many people just have the standard broccoli carrots beans you know they'll eat a couple of different types of proteins and that's it and so we should be aiming to be eating at least 40 different types of foods a week mm. and how many people would do that oh very few no it's the meat and three veg yes. you know yeah. Kind, of, kind of approach, which, you know, I understand people are short for time and, yeah. you know, all of that, but it is, it's an importance of um, having a, a, a wide variety, as wide a variety of diet mm. as you possibly can, you know, yeah. within your budget. And it's funny because a lot of the treatment protocols that we use to help to, to rebalance that microbiome is not always antimicrobials. A lot of times it's different types of fibers, Yeah, you know, so partly hydrolyzed guar, guar gum, inulin, those sort of things can be really effective at helping to um, rebalance that microbiome and what does that tell you that that's the things that we should be having in our diet yeah. every day resistant anyway. starches and resistant like starches that. yeah so there's also other foods that you know we can uh, apart from the different diets there are specific foods that can cause gut symptoms as well and i think a pretty common one that some some people will probably be aware of is lactose in those who mm -hmm. are lactose intolerant mm -hmm. so lactose is that sugar that we find in in, in dairy products mm -hmm. um and some people um you know uh, just can't digest lactose very well. And the, the most common symptom of lactose intolerance is, you know, diarrhea, mm -hmm. gas, mm. all of those those kinds of symptoms, cramping. Yeah. Um, but generally, you know, you, you'll know if you are lactose intolerant because oh, you, you know. Yeah, you, you get those <laughs> symptoms pretty, pretty quick yeah. after having any kind of dairy products. Mm. Um, so that's a, a very common one. What other kinds of foods can trigger gut symptoms as well, well i mean gluten is a big one and i know a lot of people roll their eyes when naturopaths talk about gluten but it is an very it is a highly inflammatory food and if you already have an inflammatory condition going on in the gut putting in more of that inflammatory food is just adding to the fire basically so it's not that gluten is necess necessarily bad itself but in particular environments it can really exacerbate those symptoms so you know your dairies and your glutens are the two of the big ones that we look at taking out when there is an inflammatory condition um, at least until we calm everything down and get everything back um, to balance. And sometimes we can reintroduce those foods and sometimes we can't. Yeah, because we'll have, to, we'll have different tolerance levels, yeah. right? So, of course, some some people who have celiac genes, the HLA-DQ genes, you know, they're going to be more affected by, mm -hmm. by gluten. Other people may not notice any symptoms. Yeah. What is interesting, though, is... Um, I think this is something I read, may have read in the National Geographic quite a few years ago, is they found that mummies, Egyptian mummies, is they found that they had, I don't know how they would measure this, but that they had leaky gut. Because remember, mm. they had a lot of grains, you know, the mm. older grains, the spells and the kamuts and things like that back mm. then. Still, there's still gluten there, not as much as in the, I guess, the newly developed varieties mm. of, of wheat, but they did have quite a high grain intake back mm. then. And so they found even traces of leaky gut in mummies. Isn't that and so the, the conclusion that they came to is that gluten creates uh, leaky gut in every single person. It's just some of us we feel and some of us who don't. Yeah. And it, it apparently it works on those uh, the, 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 the junctions, the tight yeah. gap the junctions. Junction. So gluten does uh, kind of like open those little doors mm. and, and after a while they'll close. But for some people, those doors kind of stay open for a lot longer than what they should. Mm. And that's kind of what creates that whole leaky gut thing. Yeah. So some people just experience it more severe than others. Yeah. And that's why whenever there's cases of autoimmunity, that's the first thing we look at taking out, um, you know, because they can be, they can really exacerbate that symptoms because autoimmunity 
you know, there is that gut permeability connection there. So you're putting glutens, you're just making things worse and continually stimulating that, uh, hyper-stimulating that immune fun- immune system. So they're big things that we definitely have to be taking out when we're looking at that um, permeability. Yeah, because mm. I know even some companies who in their supplements put gluten in for the, for the reason of opening up those gap oh, junctions and yeah. increase, the absor- increase the absorption yes. of the substance, yeah. which I thought was... Wow. Interesting. That is interesting, isn't it? Ooh. Wow. Um, what about preservatives and uh, even artificial sweetness? Is oh, really big ones as well. Particularly those alcohol sugars can be really yeah. detrimental to that microbiome. Mm, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Preservatives. I mean, I mentioned the propionic acid. Yeah. You know, which is a common preservative to mm. stop back, you know, food from spoiling. Yeah. Um, that can. Ab- you know, we have to remember with preservatives. The whole point of a preservative is to stop food from going bad. Food go bad because bacteria start to grow on it. So mm-hmm. a preservative's job is to stop bacteria from growing, mm-hmm. right? And, and making the food last longer. It's going to do exactly the same in your gut. Yeah. It's going to stop the bacteria in your gut from growing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it, it makes that's, sense. that's kind of like how it works. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, you know, uh, it's erroneous to kind of think, oh, these things, you know, taking, eating a lot of preservatives is not going to affect my gut microbiome. Of course it is. Yeah. Um, again, you know, depending on the amount of preservatives you eat, you know, if it's, uh, you may get away with small amounts of it, you know, I guess it depends on the health of your gut and the, um, yeah, I guess how, how robust your bacteria is, how healthy mm. they are. Mm. Uh, but you certainly don't want to be consuming vast amounts of preservatives. No, definitely not. Um, and, and I guess that comes back to diet being the most important thing. And I guess, it's changing definitely now, but there's still some people that don't feel that their diet is really having a, a huge impact on what their health condition, but it's having a massive impact. And even small changes like taking out some preservatives or, you know, just reducing your sugars can have a huge um, impact and yeah. a positive impact on your gut health. Yeah, you don't have to have a perfect diet. No. It's not about having no the perfect diet. Perfect. No one. No well, one except for us in the room. Except for Nessa, he's not perfect. <laughs> 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 but generally, yeah, it's that 80-20 rule. Yep. You know, 80% healthy, 20% bad, and we've still got to live a little bit. So, you know, but, but yeah, diet is the, it's the foundation of everything. You know, we can give um, uh, treatment protocols and antimicrobials and all those different supplements, but if your diet isn't 100%, if your diet isn't balanced, then those supplements are just going to be a Band-Aid again, just like yeah. any other medication. That's so, right. Food is medicine. Yeah. Isn't that? Uh, yeah, well, that's one of the naturopathic yeah. laws. Mm. Yeah, food is medicine. That's right. Definitely. Yeah. So what else can be um, cause some gut issues that we might well, not be entirely aware of? You know, I guess one of the um, a common one would be water contamination as well. Mm. You know, like th- that's probably more when we get to traveling, you know, yes. uh, where you get to food poisoning. So when you travel to third world countries or where or even just areas where there isn't um I guess reliable clean sources of water so it could be even in regional areas where you where you rely on tank water mm. um, of course, many organisms can grow can grow in, in the water yeah what I, what I'm find kind of interesting is you know this is kind of where you know we can you, we have to kind of think oh you know which is worse kind of thing because town water gets treated with chlorine yeah. to kill the bacteria in it right which makes it a cleaner water. But then it goes back to the preservatives. Chlorine is designed to, you know, kill bacteria in the water. What does it do when you drink chlorine water? You yeah. Know? Does yeah. it also have a detrimental effect on the gut? So I guess uh, with water, you know, both, you know, uh, um, contaminated water with parasites. Parasites is a common one in tank water. Very common. Yeah. yeah. And, and even when we see clients and we say, have you been overseas? Because that's a common place to pick up parasites. Yeah. So I said, no, I haven't. Well, where do you live? Do you live in a regional area? Are you on tank water? Oh, yeah, my tank water. And perhaps they don't have the right filtration system. And that's so easy to pick up some parasites oh, yeah. from that. Yeah. yeah, my husband used to drink uh, water f- on his uncle's farm. And he said, and he's telling me the other day, oh, yeah, no, I used to see them all swimming oh, around no. in the water. <laughs> oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, we thought it was normal. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, I think we need to do a parasite just for flavor. There. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a bit scary. So, but yeah, I mean, so, so anything like that, mm. there can certainly be some uh, contamination there as well. Mm. But I do want to, because I don't want us to forget about stress. I think stress oh, is a big one. Well, it's the biggest one really, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and who isn't stressed? That's right. <laughs> These days. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. Like a lot of people uh, are experiencing a lot of stress at the moment, whether mm. it's financial 
or just being isolated, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so for me, you know, the big, re- you know, a, a good explanation for people to understand why stress is such a big thing is looking at the autonomic nervous system. Yeah. So you want to you want to talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic versus sympathetic? Yeah. So you, as you said, parasympathetic, no, sympathetic. So sympathetic is your fight or flight essentially. So that's what's activated when your body thinks you are um, in danger or need to run away from something. Uh, and your parasympathetic is your rest and your, your digest. So that's when you relax and everything is working effectively. So how you many produce your stomach acid in exactly. your bile? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Rest, digest. So you're digesting. Your body's recovering and um, regenerating. How many of us sit in our parasympathetic nervous system very often? Probably 2%, yeah. if that. Yeah, because yeah. we eat on the run. Yeah. We don't sit down in a relaxed environment. Yeah. We either sit by our desks or office desks and eat. Yeah. We gulp food down uh, on our way to the gym or, or what have you. So yeah. we're constantly in a rush to get things done. And that in itself is a stress. And you can say to somebody, do, do you have a lot of stress in your life or are you stressed? No. But how do you, what do you do around meal times? I'm running around or I'm, you know, trying to get it done while I'm at my work desk or I'm watching TV or I'm watching a scary movie. Sounds silly, but that's still activating that stress response. So, yeah. you know, that adrenaline. So um, that is all stress and that is all impacting how you, your digestive function. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a scary movie, you know. Like I know one of my dear friends, uh, he used to, he was, uh, you know, obsessed about measuring his heart rate variability to measure that sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous response. Yeah. And he found that every time he watched his favorite show, which was MasterChef, he would go into a, <laughs> really? yeah, he would go into wow. a sympathetic response because he got all excited. <laughs> excited. So if you sit in front of the TV uh, yeah. watching your favorite show, well, you well, know. Well, I'm getting excited. Well, that's true. <laughs> I guess I never thought about that. I don't get that excited about food, but yeah. Not MasterChef. Maybe he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. But that's all part of it. So, and how many people just don't have time? I don't have time to sit down and eat. I'll just do it on the way or I eat in the car on the way from here to here. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm first feeding the kids and if yes. I have time, I'll eat. Or I'll know. feed the kids and I'll just eat a bit of theirs while I'm feeding them. And so all of that is still activating that stress response. It's reducing our stomach acid. It's reducing our enzyme. It's shuttling um, blood away from the, our gut to our extremities. So there's so many factors that are going to reduce that um, digestive function. Yeah. And then over time, if that continues, that's when we start to see that dysbiotic effect again. Yeah, because the food doesn't get digested and it ferments. It yeah. serves as food for gut bacteria. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you your um, emotional stress will also affect it. I mean, how many people, you know, have uh, that ang- that uh, uh, performance anxiety when they have to do a speech and then mm. they get the runs, you know? Yeah. Or, um, you know, we know that a lot of people with IBS symptoms, um, it gets triggered off by stressful events. Mm. And then it come, the, then we can talk about the gut brain access as well and how that's affected um, and how you know our emotions can affect our gut and that's because we do have that second brain in the gut um, and you know people think that everything's up here and it's been happening in the brain but primarily everything's in the gut and the gut's relaying information to the brain so that's responding to what's going on in the gut not the other way around what people yeah. think so I think initially when we were first created and we were bacteria the gut was actually developed before the brain. So the guts, the gut was there first, oh, that's and then interesting. the brains come off that, and then we have the vagus nerve. Mm. This is what sends the messages back and forth, and that's um, activated by parasympathetic, so it responds to that sort of thing as well. So there's that connection. So it's really interesting. When people, you say you've got to get out of your head. It's not really your head that's the problem. It's it's your gut, and you know that butterflies in your stomach, as you said, if you're nervous or you're excited, um, that's that's all coming from the gut. Yeah. Mm. And then, of course, you know, from the gut to the brain, there's also uh, certain uh, chemical compounds like serotonin that gets yeah. produced in the gut by um, E. coli type bacteria. Yeah. And not, we're not talking about the E. coli that causes food poisoning yeah. or harmful effects. This is a beneficial E. coli bacteria mm. uh, that's predominantly responsible for making neurotransmitters such as serotonin. Yeah. And serotonin, of course, we need that in the brain for healthy mood and you know, uh, brain you know, executive functioning of the forebrain, but also for the gut because serotonin is what sends that message uh, for you to go to the toilet. Mm. So, you know, it's peristalsis. That's, that's yeah. right. Because you get two types of constipation, mm. right? So, the one type of constipation is you don't even get the urge to go. Yeah. That's a serotonin deficiency mm. because serotonin is designed to give you that urge. Yeah. Other people will get the urge, but then they just struggle, you know, to pass a stool. Mm. And that's more fiber, water, yeah. lack of bile, maybe those kinds yeah. of things. And so that's why it's important to understand your symptoms so you, we can trace it back to mm. what's driving those symptoms. Mm. And then we can connect it to things like sleep. So if you're having sleep disturbances, 
you're constipated, not getting the urge to go, then that, that's your serotonin that's there. Your serotonin. So, yeah, so, you know, and that's it. And that's neurotransmitters in the gut coming back to that gut brain connection. So it's really, it's really fascinating. So, um, so yeah, stress, stress is huge. It's, it's a huge, it's the biggest one. And then it's underrated. It. Yeah, mm. completely underrated. Yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, people that are saying, I'm just working a lot or I'm, I'm having to do 60, 70 hours a week at the moment. I'm exhausted. I'm not sleeping very well. Well, you're going to end up with gut issues out of that. So, you know, yep. yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, you know, a few other things, um, you know, hormones. Hormones is another one that can influence, uh, you know, or can can cause gut symptoms as well. Yes. Um, with um, you know, estrogen and progesterone, the the two um, more common ones. Mm. Um, so, and it's kind of interesting because you know, uh, a lot of women, you know, if, if I look back at a lot of my clients, yeah, it kind of like correlates. A, a lot of women have these gut symptoms at certain times of a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So that constipation or the diarrhea. Mm. So the diarrhea, well, it can, can be either for people. Diarrhea is quite common around their cycle. So, yeah, and that's related back to those sex hormones. That's right. Mm. Because the in the follicular phase, which mm. is the first uh, first two weeks in a typical cycle, um, where estrogen is dominant, um, if women have a lot of estrogen, it can kind of trigger off a diarrhea effect. Yeah. And then progesterone, which is more in the luteal phase, which is uh, after post-ovulation, um, that kind of triggers off more constipation and bloating and things like that. Mm. So that's why a lot of women can get these, what they would, they would probably diagnose themselves with IBS, but these variable um, gut patterns mm. throughout the cycle, depending on where they're at. And it's, that's a good way to have a sort of have a look at what's happening with their hormones as well. So if they're not luteal phase, they're still getting a lot of diarrhea. Perhaps they're, they're estrogen dominant and they're just de- de- progesterone deficient. So yeah. that could be part of it. Um, and then I guess there's that other factor with hormones we're looking at when we're looking at phase three detoxification. So that can come back to that dysbiosis and gallbladder insufficiency, that sort of thing. We're not eliminating effectively, we're recycling those hormones. Then we're creating a, um, an imbalance in our hormones. And then that starts that off. And then that sort of is a vicious cycle back to the gut. So it sort of goes around and around. Absolutely. It? And that's why, you know, you, you see a lot of, a lot of, uh, people with hormonal imbalances mm. and gut issues. Yeah. You know, this is why we have to look at everything. It's yeah. not just, uh, you know, separate parts of the body. No. We're one body. We are one work system. Together. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I, I believe because I love the gut, it's my, my thing. And I think everything starts in the gut. So, you know, we're looking at hormonal imbalances and things like that. We have to look at, what's happening in the gut and what the connection is there as to how that could be contributing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another one that I, I want to kind of quickly mention, because we should have really talked about it in the diet section, is uh, pancreatic enzymes. Mm. Um, because we know that with raw food, when we eat raw fruits and vegetables, there are en- enzymes in these foods as long as it's fresh and not been in a cool room for six months, yeah. you know. Um, Cold storage from that's overseas. Right. <laughs> from overseas. So we're talking about, you know, you grow your veggies in your garden or you go to a farm, organic farm, buy your veggies. Uh, that generally are, you know, have high enzy- enzymatic content. And so when you eat raw food, um, it, because you're getting all these enzymes and it kind of takes a bit of pressure off the pancreas as well. Yeah. Now, if you um, eat constantly processed foods or foods that, that just puts a lot of pressure on your pancreas to uh, and your small intestine with all of their um, enzyme processes, then that can then also um, create a gut g- dysbiosis. Mm, definitely. And I think that comes back to, to diet and what our diet is like as well. If we eat all raw foods, we can have issues there. Yep. If we eat all cooked foods, we have issues. So again, we have to have that balance of the right. both. Yeah, that's right. And probably why a lot of people eat more cooked foods in winter, more raw foods in summer, yeah. you know, but uh, definitely a diversity there. Yeah. And at different times, you know, if there's times when you're more stressed or in the mornings you're running around and you don't feel comfortable eating a big meal, that's when you have things like your smoothies and things like that that don't really need a lot of di- digestion to, to um, affect there. So that can help to take a bit of burden off as well. So, you know, looking at times of the day when you are more stressed as to what you're putting in your mouth and how well it's, how easily it is to be digested. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, then a, a, probably a lesser known cause, um, surgery. Yeah. Um, and, you know, f- first it could be a very temporary um, aspect because a lot of People who undergo, you know, all people who undergo surgery get put, uh, get anesthetics and painkillers and mm. things like that. And these can have an effect on gut motility as well. Yeah. Uh, they typically cause a, a temporary constipation, but why a lot of people get put on laxatives 
uh, post-surgery. Um, and it's just because of those drugs numb the communication between the brain and the gut, right? That's the kind of like the idea, it numbs the nerves and, yeah. and, and all of that. Um, th th that's one common reason. But there's also another way that surgery can affect gut health as well, right? Mm. Um, yeah, so another one is really common in surgeries, um, adhesions, scar tissue. That's the thing can cause blockages. So um, that's really common as well and not over, not thought of yeah. commonly. And so, so if there is scar tissue and adhesions, I've heard, I've heard, you know, I've never experienced this myself, but there's, um, what do they call it? They call it uh, organ manipulation, I believe. Oh. So it's, I think there's certain physiotherapists who get trained in this or body workers who get trained in it. And I believe it's a, it's, you've got to know what you're doing. So mm. please don't know what out there to try this. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, they, they, they kind of, uh, you've got to know where to go with your hands. Um, um, but kind of like, you know, mobilizing organs and uh, breaking down that scar oh, tissue and wow. lesions. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, that's similar, I guess, the things like SIBO and there can be issues with the ileocecal valve yeah, being yeah. blocked and you can manipulate that manually as well to, to reopen that. So I guess it's the same um, same process. But, yep. wow, you really want to know what you're doing, don't you? Just Whoa. get your hands in there. Yeah. And apparently, you know, like I said, I don't know too much about it, but um, there's also uh, some, you know, even though someone has scar tissue, there's, there's a timing factor to it as well because it yeah. can make some people quite ill um, mm -hmm. if it's not done correctly or at the right time. Um, but that's, the, I guess, the point just being that there are ways mm. that that uh, can still be worked with. Mm. Well, I guess that's like any sort of injury. If you have scar tissue, you, you manipulate that and massage that to break down that scar tissue. So I guess it's the same thing. It's just a little bit more of a complex process. That's right. To, yeah. To find it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to be fiddling no. around those delicate areas. So um, No, I mean, we as naturopaths, we, we learn to palpate um, the liver and things like that. So, yeah. I, you know, you sort of know where certain things are, but, yeah, you really want to know what you're doing. Absolutely. Mm. Well. So that kind of like covers a lot of things mm. that affects gut health, mm. that can produce gut symptoms, um, you know, and we can see there's so many things. There's probably even more that we haven't even thought about. Mm. Um, but a lot of areas in our environment and in our lifestyle and in our diet that can affect our gut health and also just be responsible for producing transient gut symptoms mm. as well. Um, well, that's another one we didn't really touch on the environmental, you know, pollutants and things like that can be really a, a big thing as well. Yeah. Um, household cleaners, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, glyphosate. Glyphosate. Yeah, glyphosate. All that one. sort of stuff. Huge. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're surrounded by this sort of thing all the time. Yeah. I mean, they use it in uh, commercial food production. Mm. Um, some countries a bit more than others. Um, but we already know that glyphosates interrupt the life cycle of of bacteria and mm. so it you know it affects uh, our gut mi microbial species as well yeah which is why eating organic is always preferred yeah uh, and if you can't buy 100 percent organic all the time because we understand that it can be a bit more costly mm. um, you can kind of choose the most um they, they call it the the dirty dozen and the clean 15 yeah. you know that's something that people can look up if they'd like um mm. Uh, and it gives you like, you know, what's your most contaminated produce that you really want to mm -hmm. try and get organic and yeah. the other ones you can get away with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and even things like emotional factors can be really uh, have a com like a, a really significant uh, impact on your gut health as well that you may not think. So, you know, being in toxic environments, that sort of thing. I know um, there's issues with women that are in toxic uh, or domestic abuse um, uh, situations. A lot of them develop autoimmune conditions. It's really common. Wow. And that's coming back to that gut and that gut permeability and then that immune um, dysregulation. So uh, environmental, uh, you know, emotional type things in the environment can be really impactful as well. And I think we don't think about those sort of things as well. So yeah. um, there's, there's sort of things to, to be mindful of as well what, what is your environment like that's right i mean how, how often i've no, i've heard quite a few times where uh, someone had like all these health issues and they let's say they quit their job and they're like oh all of a sudden all my health issues just went away mm. and they didn't quit the job because of the health issues yeah. they quit the job because they were unhealthy uh, like uh, unhappy stressed mm. whatever and then surprised that a lot of their physical issues have cleared mm. have cleared up so yeah we underestimate the emotional um i guess the, the taxation it has on the body. Yeah. Well, how often do you hear people that they've, they've got all these health issues, the gut issues, they've got the IBS, that sort of thing. They go away for two or three weeks, it all clears up. As yeah. soon as they come back, it starts again. That's right. So, yeah, yeah environment can, uh, environmental, uh, what we're surrounded by and the people we're surrounded by can have a huge impact as well. So that's something that we 
we need to look at also for our own health. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we've got a lot today. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully that gives some people a bit of an idea of areas in their life where they may have to look at making maybe making some changes if they if they do have some gut issues or struggle with some uh, symptoms, gut symptoms, maybe something you resonates with them. Mm. But it was also just good to kind of illustrate to people how it's not the same for everyone. Yes. It's not a one treatment fits all. Mm. It's not like, oh, just take a probiotic and you'll be oh, fine. We didn't touch on probiotics, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole nother, yeah. another thing. So it's important to understand where your symptoms are coming from and, yeah. and, and addressing that and understanding how a lot of your choices can um, have an influence on, on your gut health yeah. and no one's perfect you know no. not 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 that you or me have a perfect diet and do oh, everything no. right we'd probably do a stool test and be horrified at what we find there so it's <laughs> yeah. not about that's why we avoid doing it that's why we avoid doing it but <laughs> yeah. you make everyone else exactly. do one exactly <laughs> um, so it's just do kind as of, I say not as I do <laughs> that's right that's right is that aggressive enough <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of like understanding and then, you know, um, knowing how to change or influence yeah. those decisions. And I know it's a saying and it's been said a lot, but I, I love it. All health begins in the gut and it really does. So yeah. if our gut isn't right, not, we're going to be imbalanced everywhere. So yeah, you'll we, see it on your skin. Oh, yeah. yeah, emotional, mental health, so many things, mm. so many things. So it's really important to ensure that you're doing the best you can for your gut health. So, um, you know, some of these things that we may not, you may not correlate with gut issues can can be. So hopefully sort of put a bit of a spotlight on that and, um, you know, people can start to look a little bit deeper into what could be contributing to their gut issues. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was fun having a chat with you today, I know. Nicole. It's you know, fun. yeah, it was it was fun. And we both love the gut, so that's always oh, we, we do. Yeah. I mean, we love everything, but we love the gut more. Oh. Well, because we know how important it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so we'll have a chat next week again, yeah. and um, we'll say goodbye to all our listeners. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening. And remember, question everything. Well, except what we say. So cause a lot of <laughs> <laughs> this is your fault as soon as like you go you know what's going to happen right <laughs> while you're looking down and you're giggling <laughs> I come if I look at you I go alright let's just refocus <laughs> alright intense okay yeah so ins- <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> oops oops we can't even, we can't even make a joke about that Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're gonna you're gonna it's implode in a minute now. <laughs> I don't know, wow. just cut that out. But probably that's not good to say. No, we can say that. <laughs>